So let me spend the first 10 minutes or so very briefly review basic idea of ADHD correspondence just so that everybody is on the same page and uh, we're going to use the notation. So, uh, so we start with the D-dimensional antiliter space and uh, that is uh, supposed to be dual to conformal field theory in one lower dimension. Uh, let me actually use this notation so that ADS is D plus one dimension, conformal field theory is D-dimension. And uh, so we often draw this kind of uh, uh, picture. Uh, and uh, uh, we use, uh, for example, the global coordinate. Oh, yeah, this is a, a, a metric for the unit. Uh, uh, D minus one dimensional sphere, which is a sphere on the boundary of uh, uh, antiliter space. And uh, uh, we suppose we consider a Klein Gordon equation uh, then uh, well, we can try to solve this equation, and then what you do? is uh, you postulate that phi has uh, some uh, uh, time dependence like that, and then uh, 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 try to solve differential equation for this one. And then if you uh, try to find normalizable mode, then you find that uh, omega is equal to start with delta, and then some integer moding. where delta is related to the, the mass of the particle by this equation. So, so if, you, if I draw the relation between the mass and delta, so you have a mass square and delta, and then it has uh, this kind of quadrat uh, quadratic property. And uh, uh, the middle of that is d over 2. So, uh, okay. So, uh, this satisfies the Brighton Loader Friedman bound, which is that uh, this is greater than minus uh, d over 4, d over 2. You cannot read it, so I have to raise it. So, this is greater than minus d square over 4. So, so this satisfies the Brighton Loader Friedman bound. And uh, uh, so typically, you only take this kind of branch so that uh, for each delta, you have a unique mass square and vice versa. But in this range, actually, for given mass, there are two choices of delta. And uh, it depends on the kind of boundary condition that you impose for the scalar field. So, so if you have a particle whose delta, uh, if you have a conformal field state operator whose delta is smaller than this, then you have to choose the appropriate boundary condition. OK? So uh, there is also a choice of a Poincaré coordinate, which will become useful later. So in Poincaré coordinate, uh, you only cover some uh, fraction of uh, the boundary and also interior. So, so in this coordinate, the uh, ADS metric can be expressed uh, in this way. So dz square minus dt square. Well, let me write it as dx square over z square, where dx square is equal to minus dx naught square plus uh, d minus 1 dx i square. So you have a standard. Minkowski metric on the boundary, and then you have a radius direction z. And uh, so in this case, this same f can be a function of z and x. And then it has, uh, so near the boundary, it has this kind of behavior. And uh, for example, if delta is in this range, then we say that uh, uh, this will be normalizable mode. Uh, 
And then this part is non-normalizable. That uh, uh, this diverges uh, faster towards the boundary. If delta is large, this exponent is large. The boundary go is correspond to z goes to zero. So this diverges, this converges. So this is called normalizable part. This is called non-normalizable part. So uh, in conformal field theory, what this means is that A is a source and B is an expectation value. In CFT. By that means that when you have non-trivial A for this operator, what it means is that uh, the Lagrangian density of the CFT is deformed by adding some operator on the boundary where operator O is an operator dual to the scalar field phi. So ADS CFT correspondence uh, identify field with an operator. So, so when you have non-trivial A, you add this operator to the boundary, whereas uh, B is related to the expectation value of the same operator. So this is the case for scalar field, but you can do the same thing for gauge field and metric, etc. Okay, so this is sort of very sort of quick uh, uh, summary of uh, aspect of ads -CFT correspondence that I'm going to use. I, Presume many of you know this, but this is just to set up notation. Okay? Uh, so, but this is uh, very important uh, because uh, uh, you can ask, especially because of this condition, what more precise relation between the operator on the boundary and uh, the uh, corresponding uh, scalar field in the bulk. So for example, suppose you do the, uh, suppose, well, this ADS-CFT correspondence is a useful idea uh, when uh, the bulk gravitational theory can be weakly coupled. So therefore, you can consider sort of uh, quantize, uh, you can treat all of these scalar fields and other fields almost like a free field, interacting very weakly with each other. So, so if you ignore interaction between particles, then the Hilbert space uh, should be just a Fox space of this scalar field. That's the first order approximation to the Hilbert space of uh, quantum gravity ADS. And then, then you have to modify it by adding interaction between them. So that must capture some aspect of the Hilbert space of conformal field theory, and therefore the uh, operator on it. So that means that uh, when we say that the uh, scalar field corresponds to some operator, scalar field in the ADS correspond to some operator on the boundary, there must be more direct relation between them. So namely that suppose you do the uh, perturbative quantization of a scalar field, there is an operator that uh, uh, create and an annihilate scalar field in the bulk. And that operator should be related to the operator on the boundary. Okay? So, so this idea was uh, initially uh, uh, pursued by Banks and the collaborator in the late uh, uh, 90s, as soon as the ads correspondence was proposed, and refined by many others, uh, in particular by uh, Kabat and Lifshitz and the collaborators. And uh, uh, so there is this uh, a kind of expression where this operator can be expressed as integral of uh, operator, the corresponding operator. So this is an uh, uh, operator in the bulk of ADS, and uh, this is the operator in C. And then there are interactions. So this is, this is when there are uh, no, no interactions, you can make this identification. But then there are corrections due to bulk interactions. And also because of the fact that in general, uh, you, uh, you can complain. So when I write an expression like that, you can complain by saying that there is no actually 
uh, a physical, physical observable in the gravitational theory, which is localized in the bulk. Because uh, uh, the bulk theory is gravitational theory, so it has to have a diffeomorphism invariance. So for theory with diffeomorphism invariance, there is no precise notion of local operator in the bulk. And, uh, but in the weakly coupled gravitational theory where the, uh, the Planck scale is much smaller than the other scales that we are interested in, there is a sufficiently approximate notion of local operator that we can consider. And you can correct this effect by including interaction with gravitational degrees of freedom, metric, etc. So this procedure is called gravitational dressing. So, and then, if this is a gauge, uh, it has, uh, it, 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 this operator has the, uh, the, the gauge interaction, then it has to also be dressed by gauge fields, so this is called gauge dressing. So you have to do gravitational and the gauge dressing. But these are subreading effects that uh, uh, we have to pay attention to, but uh, we can take care of it uh, order by order uh, in the uh, weak gravitational uh, interaction. Okay? And uh, so this is, a, this is a, a sort of function which depends on the bulk point and boundary point. So you choose the bulk point Z and X, on which we want to put operator on it. And then there is a boundary point on which uh, uh, you, you, you put the local operator. And you smear this operator on the boundary to reproduce this operator. Uh, it's important to point out that this is not the bulk boundary propagator. G of Z, X, X prime is not the bulk boundary propagator. The bulk boundary propagator is a function which uh, you can obtain by, by having source at this point and then see how the bulk field behaves. So that would be the definition of bulk boundary propagator. And in particular, the bulk operator, when it approaches to the boundary, has uh, this type of non-normalizable behavior. Okay? But that's not what we want. What we want is the realization of this uh, bulk operator in terms of CFT operator. So in particular, if I take the expectation value on this side, you should have expectation value on this side as well. So that means that as this point approaches to the bulk point, the behavior should be that of the normalizable mode rather than non-normalizable. So that is why, that is why this is not the bulk boundary propagator, because bulk boundary propagator would have non-normalizable behavior toward this point. Okay, I hope that's clear because this point is important. So namely that this when, when x approaches its x prime and z goes to zero, then it should behave like z to the delta rather than z to the d minus delta, okay? So this is called a, a smearing function. In general, this is a sort of complicated function, and uh, this is somewhat related to what uh, David was talking this morning, I think, there before me, because this is, so in the Euclidean context, these are like shadow to each other. And, uh, and in fact, the expression for, shadow, expression for smearing operator is also similar to what uh, David was writing this morning, I believe, because you can write g of z x x prime to be equal to integral of the third point where you consider a correlation between this operator and, uh, and then some function which I'm going to define c w prime and c prime where C double prime, C prime is sort of inverse of the two-point correlation function on the boundary CFT in the sense that if you integrate this, uh, it becomes a delta function on the boundary.
So, so the smearing function essentially is given by two-point function of the bulk and the boundary. So this would have uh, sort of non-normalizable behavior when this approaches to this point. But then it's, mu it's multiplied by the inverse of the two-point function uh, uh, of the boundary. And uh, uh, in general, this is sort of a, a highly singular function. For example, this has a singularity if it goes like 1 over x minus x prime to the 2 delta, for example. And uh, so this, this function in general can only be defined in a sense of distribution. So this, again, is very different from the bulk boundary propagators. Okay. So perhaps uh, there is a way to sort of connect it to what we heard this morning. Yeah, I can just comment that, uh, yeah, this is basically you're taking the, in the language this morning, you're taking the shadow transform of the bulk to boundary propagator. Right. Yeah, so maybe that's a better way of saying it. So it's not the bulk boundary propagator itself, but it's shadow. Is that what you want to say? Yeah, maybe that's sort of a better way to say it. Yes, thank you. Okay, so, uh, but it was pointed out uh, uh, that uh, you, you don't have to actually do this integral over the entire boundary point, but you only have to do it in some subspace of the boundary point. And this is going to be very important for the rest of my talk, so I want to explain this uh, a little bit more. The first of all, uh, uh, it was already known some time ago that you can choose this. So there are various different ways of choosing this function. Just like so when you define a propagator, you can choose boundary condition. Depending on that, the behavior of the propagator is different. Uh, th this also has a, a various different prop uh, properties. And it was shown by Hamilton uh, uh, Kabat and Lifshitz. Uh, I think there, are, there is actually a long list of papers. This is just a representative uh, of this list. But uh, they have shown the following, that uh, suppose you have a, a ADS space, and then suppose you have a Cauchy surface. But suppose you consider subspace of the Cauchy surface. And then, uh, then you can actually, con uh, so this is, let's call this as A. Let's call this as A. And then, uh, then you can ask, what is the domain of dependence of A? Okay, so, uh, so you can consider some kind of causal diamond uh, starting from here. And then the, the, it intersects on the boundary too. And uh, uh, so, so th there, is, there is a, a domain of dependence of A and there is a causal wedge. of A in the bulk. And then uh, what you can show is that uh, if Z and X is in the causal wedge of A, then you can actually write this operator as in terms of Green's function, uh, sorry, bar, uh, smearing function on the, uh, in the, uh, on the boundary, but restricted to the domain of dependence of A. So, uh, so namely that uh, uh, as far as uh, 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 this, op we are so we don't have to integrate 
on the entire space, we can only restrict to this kind of causal diamond of the domain of A side of the causal diamond, domain of dependence of A, uh, in order to reproduce bulk operator. So, so this is a, a refinement of, of this type of notion. And uh, this was sort of surprising. So, uh, so in the case of ADHD correspondence, we would think that uh, information in the bulk point is sort of spread over on the boundary. But uh, uh, it was realized that uh, there is actually refined, more refined correspondence where uh, the subregion in the bulk, in this case, the, uh, the causal wedge uh, of this region uh, correspond to the domain of dependence on the boundary. Okay? So, so this is called the subregion subregion duality. So, so this, this has been investigated very carefully by many people, Polchinski, uh, Kabat, Lifshitz, Hamilton, etc., uh, uh, and uh, uh, very well understood. But uh, this has led to some puzzle. And uh, so I understand I'm supposed to stop in uh, five or 10 past one. So let me uh, this point out the puzzle and its resolution for the rest of the time. And then at the beginning of the next lecture, I'm going to use it to prove that uh, global symmetry does not exist. So let me just do it for the reminder of time. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the original motivation was a causal wedge, and it was understood later that uh, you can extend it to uh, entanglement wedge. And uh, yes, indeed, you are quite. Yeah. So I, so I wasn't. Yeah, I wasn't prepared to discuss all these details. It's it's very important, but uh, yeah. So that ought to be a lecture by itself. So yes, but thank you for pointing it out. So. In general, yeah, in general, the uh, entanglement wedge is larger than the causal wedge. So, and uh, in fact, the bulk subregion subregion duality extends to the uh, entanglement wedge. And, uh, uh, okay, so, but for, for what I'm going to talk about, uh, the distinction is not important, but the more important thing is that there is a subregion subregion duality, which leads to the following paradox. Uh, the paradox is this. So, so what, what this kind of subregion, subregion duality means that suppose let's project things on the one Cauchy slice, okay? So then the picture is like that. So suppose you have some, some region A. So then you can actually draw some subspace of the bulk for which the local operator in the bulk can be expressed entirely in terms of smearing of operator on the boundary segment here. And uh, as Raphael pointed out, in general, uh, this can be an uh, 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 entanglement wedge. Uh, by that, I mean, for example, in the case of a, uh, pure ADS, this is just the real Takayanagi surface. In general, for time-dependent solution, uh, this is uh, 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 H. <laughs> Uh, HRT, so, so, so Hibune Rangamani uh, Takayanagi surface. But uh, uh, so basically, it's a minimum surface subtending to the boundary of A. Okay? So, so anything that happens inside of this uh, uh, region between Ryu Takayanagi surface and the boundary region can be described by boundary operator like that. Yes? No. So there is a so finite Newton, finite but small Newton constant. Uh, you can correct this order by order by doing the gravitational dressing and the correcting operators. Okay, so, so I assume this is done. Could you use the microphone? 
Yeah. So if you're not working in that limit, then you should be accounting for the dressing as you yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm assuming that we have done this. And we are considering operator which is slightly thicker. So but as far as this operator is away from the surface, that still works. OK, so, uh, so this is a problem. So, so there, is a, uh, there is a couple of problems. So one problem is that uh, Suppose you consider two regions. One is like this. So this is uh, A. And uh, suppose you have another region, B. So for region A, the surface is like that. And uh, so this is your uh, causal wedge or entanglement wedge. And then, then there is another causal wedge or entanglement wedge. So if you have a local operator resigning over here, then the same local operator can be expressed as smearing of operator in this yellow region, A, or red region, B. So there is a question of whether this bulk boundary map is unique or not. So there is another problem. So suppose you divide a space into three segments. So uh, uh, A, B, C. Then there is an uh, entanglement wedge for each one of them. But then there is an suppose there is an operator in the middle which is not in any of these entanglement wedge. Then this operator. Uh, cannot be constructed by, by operator in B, and in fact, commute with operator in B, and commute with operator in C, and commute with operator in A. So that means that this operator, phi hat, should commute with every local operator in B, in C, and A. So does that mean that this operator is trivial? So, uh, so it cannot be that you have a trivial operator that is not unique. So there is something wrong uh, with, with this, or there is some, some uh, uh, confusion here. So this was uh, 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 actually uh, uh, addressed by a beautiful paper by uh, Arum Harry, uh, Adon, and Halo. Uh, And then uh, expanded by uh, Don, Haro, and Wall. And then this one probably is uh, most instructive uh, by Haro in uh, 1960, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 20, uh, sorry uh, 20, uh, 2016. Uh, So, so these three papers sort of uh, clarified uh, 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 this problem. So, so the idea is the following. So, so here uh, we are uh, considering uh, sort of weakly coupled uh, gravitational system. And we are considering the perturbation of this uh, uh, near the vacuum. So we are only considering a pure ADS, the, the vacuum state of the CFT, and some small, excit small excitation of small number of particles over it. So clearly, the, so in the full Hilbert space of conformal field theory, uh, it is some subspace that we are considering. So what they pointed out is that the kind of puzzle that uh, we encounter here and uh, its explanation is exactly the one that is being used uh, in the so-called cold subspace of uh, quantum information theory. So the, in the past papers, they pointed out that uh, uh, if you consider this as a cold subspace of the uh, 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 entire Hilbert space of conformal field theory, then uh, this is actually not a paradox, but uh, this is actually a feature of the cold subspace. And then in the later papers, they show that this is actually the, the unique interpretation uh, of, uh, of this phenomena. 
So the cold subspace is, uh, uh, is an idea developed by in the uh, quantum information theory for the following purposes. That uh, when you send some information, sometimes it gets corrupted. It can, there can be noise. And uh, for example, in the case of classical information, what you do is basically you make copies. That uh, if you have a set of, uh, say, a sequence of 0, 1, 0, 1, et cetera, then you make several copy of this, and then you check to see whether. So, so for example, if the one of the number is flipped, if the rest of the copy has the same number, then you can identify which, which, which bit get flipped. That sort of idea. So you introduce some kind of redundancy in the information so that uh, you can correct the information. In the case of uh, a quantum uh, uh, system, this does not quite work as it is because uh, the quantum state cannot be copied. There is a thing called the quantum non-zero principle, which says that there is no unitary operator which sort of maps the given state into product, tensor product of identical states. That would be in contradiction with the unitarity of transformation. But there is something very similar to do which works, and that idea of quantum uh, error correction. And uh, again, what you do is sort of introduce redundancy. So instead of uh, 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 just sending one state, you consider a product of Hilbert spaces, and you consider some entangled state between these Hilbert spaces to send the information. So, so in that case, uh, in, in this example, this Hilbert space for A, B, and C is sort of this idea of duplication of the information. So the information of the state in the middle of this space is actually shared by A, B, C, but not by each one of them. So that is sort of the idea. So there is a very nice, uh, uh, very nice uh, uh, example that is uh, being used in, the, uh, in this paper that is worth mentioning. So let me uh, 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 describe it. So suppose uh, consider, uh, consider the following toy model. Suppose the Hilbert space A is three-dimensional given by these three states, and B is also three-dimensional, and C is also three-dimensional. OK. So, so there are, uh, 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 and then you consider tensor product. So the so total Hilbert space is a tensor product of this. So it's a 27 dimensional in total. And in this 27 dimensional space, you consider some subspace, three dimensional subspace. So this three dimensional subspace is spanned by three basis state. where 0 is given by 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2. And uh, 1 tilde is given by 0, 1, 2, plus 1, 2, 0, plus 2, 0, 1. And the two children is given by 0, 2, 1, 1, 0, 2, plus 2, 1, 0. So you have these three states, and then the cold subspace in this case is spanned by this. There is actually a very nice theory which makes use of symmetry and discrete group representation, but this is sort of simple, simplest case when you utilize exchange symmetry of three objects. And uh, so, so when you have this kind of setup, uh, what happens is the following. So you can actually construct some unitary operator acting on the first two Hilbert space such that if you act this on any one of these bases, 0, 1, 2, so i is 0, 1, 2. Then it maps it to 
the state for which the first state is given by the same i, and the rest is always the same state. So basically, you can push this information to the first Hilbert space. OK? So, so this is very nice, because then, suppose you have any operator O. So, so this construction is very nice, because uh, if you have uh, any operator O on the first Hilbert space, so that uh, it maps uh, i to O of i, then what you can consider is that uh, you can consider O12 to be con obtained by conjugate of this. Uh, IB and IC and U12. So if you consider this operator, what happens is that if you act this on this code subspace, you first act this. So it it's send any one of these into one of these. And then you act operator O and bring back. So then uh, what happens is that uh, this O12 acts on I tilde. exactly the same way that O would act on, the first, uh, on, on I. But this information is protected. This information is protected because, uh, so you can, you can, uh, you can change, uh, uh, you can change the, you can act, you can act, operate, you can consider operator acting on every one of this Hilbert space, A or B or C after this acting on this operator. And you can recover this information by reversing it because, uh, yeah, because of this property. And moreover, this O12, O23, so you can define similarly O12, O23, and O31. And they act in the same way. They act in the same way like this. So, so this explains this non-uniqueness of this operator. So, so you can have three different operators which act in the same way on this called subspace. And, uh, uh, So in some sense, what this says is that uh, uh, the deeper you go in the space of ADS, the more the information is spread on the boundary and it's shared. If you have a, a state which is very close to the boundary, then it, it can belong to the uh, code subspace. Uh, the, it, can, it can be uh, this, uh, constructed from operator in this small segment. So this is not well protected in some sense. And, but if you are deep inside of this, the information has to spread over in ADS. So this is better protected. So, so if you use this kind of uh, uh, language, then uh, 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 you can resolve this problem. So, so I guess uh, it's 10 past one, so maybe I should stop here. So in the next lecture, uh, I will explain uh, how uh, uh, we can use this type of idea to prove that the global symmetry in ADS contradict with the locality of conformal field theory that I mentioned, and then uh, discuss some other consequences, uh, uh, such as completeness of uh, charge, gauge charges, etc. And then uh, hope that I'll have some time to talk about the distance conjecture also. Okay, so that's it for today. Thank you.